Chapter 16, A Bowl of Bologna. I come home with a pile of pictures taken with my new camera, and I start the wall of the left behind in my bedroom. I put up the picture of an abandoned house in my neighborhood, then the pictures of towels on benches, deserted cars, and lost jackets, a sneaker, a baby stroller, and a t-shirt. I'm surprised how many things people have left behind, and I wonder if they miss them later. The house is filled with smoke when I come downstairs, which means that Grammy is making fried bologna for dinner. Turns out that when you fry a piece of bologna in butter, it goes from a flat piece to a bowl shape. Grammy never gets tired of it. She thinks it's some kind of miracle. Then she fills hers with mustard. Lots and lots of bright yellow mustard. Ronan is coming over for dinner. I wonder what he'll think of this. He arrives just in time. He has a Portuguese tart from his dad's favorite bakery to share with us. Grammy is so excited you think she would have won the showcase showdown. We sit right away. Grammy leans over and pats Ronan on the shoulder. Well, Ronan, thank you for coming over to share our meal with us. It isn't fancy but it's a favorite around here. That's okay, he says. I'm not that fancy, in case you haven't noticed. Grammy laughs loud as she scoops a heaping glob of yellow mustard into her bologna bowl. Then another blob, and another. Ronan watches, but he doesn't seem to react. Then he scoops out a blob of mustard, and another, and another and then unscrews the top of the pepper and pours some of that on top. It's almost like they're competing to see whose mouth will catch fire first. I wonder if we have a fire extinguisher. Ronan eats more fried bologna than is natural. He eats it up like it's the best thing ever and I wonder what his father makes for dinner. After Granny and Ronan finish off the jar of mustard, I stand to clear the dishes and Ronan gets up to help. You're a fine guest to help out like that, Ronan, Grammy says. Your parents have done a fine job. I think he means to say thanks, but it's almost like he doesn't know how. When Ronan asks for a dish towel to dry the dishes, Grammy laughs. <laughs> no need for that now. We let God dry the dishes here. She lumbers towards the TV. Well, she says, it's time for family feud. Seems like a funny thing to wish for. Ronan says, you're a funny one, you know that? She settles into her couch and turns to Ronan again. Your dad must be waiting on you. You need to head home soon? Nah, he says. Then he turns to me. Want to play some Monopoly? Uh, our first game took about four hours. So, you won, didn't you? I mean, barely, but you won. Barely? I don't think so. I wiped the board with you. He smirks. Yeah, whatever. You want to play or not? We set up the homemade Monopoly game that my mother made out of paper when she was my age. The board is the real one that she found at a tag sale with Grammy for only five cents. So she decided to take it and make the rest. The cards, the money, and the deeds. Everything but the tokens. We use old coins that Papa found on the beach with his metal detector for those. I chose the buffalo nickel. Ronan chooses the bicentennial silver dollar. Whenever I use this game, I think about what it would have been like to play it with my mother. I bet we would have been friends if we were the same age. Ronan gets lucky, getting all of the yellows and greens pretty fast. But I end up with a bunch of the cheaper properties, so we trade money back and forth. The game lasts forever. When we're finally done, Grammy is asleep on the couch. I shake her shoulder a bit. Grammy, Grammy, wake up. She moans and opens her eyes, looks about and gets her bearings. Oh no, I fell asleep. What time is it? Midnight, Ronan needs a ride home. Or should he walk? <gasps> oh no, I fell asleep. His father must be worried sick. Did you call him? Yeah, I did, Ronan lies. He says it's okay. I look at him, but he won't look back.
Grammy stands up. Well, I'll freshen up a bit and we'll go. You two wait outside, but don't go disappearing on me. We head outside. So, I ask, why did you tell Grammy that you called your dad? He puts his hands in his pocket and walks in small circles. I don't know. I know he does. I didn't want your Grammy to worry or be mad at me. And it makes no difference if I call my father or not. I can walk in at any time. Having no curfew sounds pretty good. And then I begin to wonder if it's true. Chapter 17, Escape from the Kinks. I've just let Ronan in when Grammy calls from the kitchen. Delsey, honey bunch, I've got some chicken legs that are past due if you want them. Really? Excellent. Ronan looks at me like I've lost my mind. Why the heck would anyone want old chicken? I shake my head. The things you don't know about living on the Cape. Well, if it involves old chicken legs, I think I can wait. You'll see, I say. You're going to love it. Oh, yeah. Nothing like rotting meat to improve my day. When we arrive at Gray's Beach, I open my bag and pull out the chicken. Some string and scissors. Here, I say, handing him the scissors. We need long pieces of string. He cuts the string, glancing at me. As I tie the string tightly around the chicken leg, Ronan looks over the side of the boardwalk. So, we're here to catch stuff? Blue crabs. I see one, he yells as he points. And another one. He glances over at me, glowing. They're everywhere. I give him a chicken leg and I take one. We lower the chicken legs over the side and into the water. Mine lies at the bottom, but Ronan's is hanging in a deeper spot. I lean over. It has to sit on the bottom somewhere so the crabs can get to it. He looks over at mine and smiles. The crabs are running from all directions and climbing onto my chicken leg. Pull it up, Ronan says, leaning over the railing. Okay, here's the thing, I say. Once they are eating, you have to pull them up smoothly, but really fast before they fall off. Because they do let go. Ready? Yeah, he steps up another rung on the railing. Hand over hand, just like pulling in nets from the reel, I pull up my string. Two feet over the water, a crab lets go. Then another. When the chicken reaches the railing, I have four crabs left. I lift the string over the railing and drop the chicken into the pail. I knock the crabs off with my hand and pull the chicken out for another round. Bending over, I say, wow, one of them is huge. Usually you can't catch those. Henry says it's a Darwin thing. They're big because they figured out how to survive. Like if you're suddenly being lifted into the air, let go. Ronan reaches into the pail and pulls out the big one. We should name him Zeus. You can't name things that you're taking home to eat. Eat? Who wants to eat this? He looks like a mini alien. The crab pinches his finger. Ow! he yells, dropping the crab on the boardwalk. It must have heard you. The crab moves sideways, running for the edge, but hits Ronan's foot. He jumps into the air and he falls down flat. I pick it up from the back so its claws can't reach my hand. It grabs a hold of the edge of the plank, but I pull it off. How'd you do that? he asks. I turned my hand and show him. They can't reach you. Well, most of the time. Sometimes a big smart one will figure it out and reach under themselves and get you. Just then I get pinched and I drop the crab, which makes another run for it. Ronan laughs hard. Really? I ask, going for the crab again. You're laughing at me? You're still lying on the deck after being taken down by something the size of a pancake. Ronan stands. I wasn't taken down. I was just resting. Then he reaches out to take the crab from me. He turns the cat crab towards his own face, looking it in the eye and smiles. He bubbles. Yeah, they do that to keep oxygen moving through their gills, I tell him. Now put it back in the bucket. Grammy will make some great crab cakes out of it with extra tartar sauce. You'll love them. 
He looks at me. Really? She'll make crab cakes? Yeah, she sure will. He stares down at the crab. And then he lifts the crab and holds it about six inches from his face. He doesn't look tasty. Wait until you've seen him with buttered breadcrumbs. His mouth swings to the side a bit. Then he looks at the bubbling crab in the eyes and says, I dub you with the name Darwin. And now you owe me one, Darwin. He winds up his arm and throws the crab well beyond the reach of the chicken on the string. It lands with a splash in the marsh. He tries to hide a smile, but he doesn't do a great job of it. Wait, what? Why would you do that? He shrugs and smiles bigger. Sorry, he was beautiful and just such a good fighter. I had to let him go. It's okay. That was better than eating crab cakes any day, I say, thinking about how much Papa Joseph would have liked him. He would have said Ronan is a good soul. And I would have to agree.